So we are officially live and let's wait for attendees to arrive and they are arriving. So while people are arriving, let me just briefly, um, not introduce, but welcome Julian and Tun. Thank you guys for uh, joining us today. Um, I will leave you to um, briefly introduce yourself later on. Um, so this is Serverless Tribe online uh, version of Serverless Singapore. This is the second edition and we are like super excited to present you two amazing speakers today. Um, you can ask them questions by using Q&A button. Um, that is uh, below somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is on your screen. Uh, but you can ask, use that button to ask the questions. And we still haven't decided if we want to do it like after each of these talks. Julian will go first, soon will go second. But feel free at any time to, to ask your questions. So I don't know how to of you feel. Shall we start and let people continue to join? Julian, do you want to start now? Yeah, I can start with my with my slides and my talk. I don't know how many people is there, are there. So eight people joined now. Eight people, okay. Yeah, well, nine well. people, yeah, nine people now. Um, all right, so, well, yeah, we can start. I'm ready. Okay, so hopefully more, more, more people will, will join soon. So let me just set up things and that should be good. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good, okay. All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to my talk. Many thanks for inviting me. So I'm Julien, I'm the Repro Advocate at Stream Native and today I will show you a quick overview of uh, Apache Pulsar. So uh, on my screen, you can see a QR code and a link. So feel free to scan this QR code. That will be the best way to reach out to me and to get access to additional resources as well. For example, I don't know, benchmarks or more detailed talks or things like that. So a few words about me. I work at Stream Native. I'm a developer advocate in Europe. I've been a software engineer for more than 20 years now, mostly using Java and Spring. I build distributed scalable and uh, event-driven systems for several industries, including uh, retail, financial services. I live in Lille in the north of France, and I'm one of the leaders and founders of several developer communities, such as the Java user group of Lille, for example. All right, so for those who don't know Stream Native, Stream Native was founded by the original creatures <coughs> of Apache Pulsar. Uh, so we provide a fully managed personal service with enterprise features, and this service can be deployed on either our infrastructure or your infrastructure as well. So what is Apache Pulsar in a few words? Apache Pulsar is a cloud native messaging and data streaming platform. So cloud native means that Pulsar is designed for running in containerized environments and it's designed also to scale out, to scale horizontally. But it's not only about scalability, but also about elasticity. Because elasticity is about adapting to workload changes, right? And Prusa is both a messaging and a data streaming platform, as we'll see. So Prusa is a messaging and streaming platform, but what is data streaming? Data streaming is the process of transmitting data continuously and in real time from a source to a destination. So the data is sent in small pieces and is processed or analyzed and received. So streaming works best when this data needs to be processed in the right order, that's important. And the data, these events, they can they be interlinked together, right? So this data may be persisted for a long time, but also be transformed or aggregated or replayed. So you may also need to read millions of records very quickly and perform also big catch-up reads, right? So this is why you need throughput. And those streaming platforms can handle a massive amount of data. So these platforms scale out horizontally, right? So typical use cases are data ingestion and real-time real -time analytics. And the most common streaming platforms are 
are, for example, Kafka is the most common one, but I can also mention Amazon Kinesis, and of course, Pulsar is also a great streaming platform. Now let's talk about messaging that is very different. Sometimes we need to assign time-consuming tasks to a group of workers. So you have one producer service that needs tasks to be performed by a consumer service that is a worker. And those tasks can take some time to process or the consumer service can be sometimes unavailable for a couple, a couple of minutes. So we don't want these events to impact the producer service. We need decoupling. So to do that, you can set up a work queue. This queue contains messages Emitted from, emitted from the producers, and each of these messages is a task to be performed by consumers. So you don't need to perform this task in a strict order this time. For example, if the task consists in, uh, let's say, pushing notifications to phones, right, to Alice's phones and to Bob's phone, it doesn't matter if I notify Alice or, Alice or Bob first, right? I, I, I won't break my system if something like that happens. So a message broker manages this message queue, the message broker accepts the producer's messages and delivers them to the consumer so they can perform the task, right? So these are some essential features for a message queue. Queues can grow faster than consumers can handle. So one expected feature is the ability to add new consumers to consume the queue faster, right? And to remove consumers when the workload decreases, right? Remember, elasticity. Another expectation is when a consumer is busy processing a message, you don't want to wait for, these, uh, for the processing to be completed. So the broker will deliver the next task to another consumer instance without waiting for the current task to be complete. When a consumer fails to handle a message because of an error or a timeout, you may need the message broker to re-deliver the message later to retry the task, right? And you also need to remove undeliverable messages to a dead letter queue, right? We need to remove them from the queue to move them to a dead letter queue. And because of that, messages may be consumed in a slightly different order than produced, right? But as I said, the order is not a strong requirement in the message queuing world. So RabbitMQ and Amazon SQS match these requirements because they implement this message queue semantic. And we cannot expect this, re this requirement from a streaming platform because streaming platform does a different job. Stream streaming platforms are not designed for that. So data streaming and messaging require a different set of features. So data streaming requirements are to be able to, be able to process the data in order to be able to ingest large amount of data, to do data retention, and to be able to handle catch-up rates, right? So Kafka does that pretty well, and Pulsar as well, because these are data streaming platforms. The messaging queuing requirements are quite different, because when you do message queuing, you need to add or remove consumer dynamically. That's important. You do not want to block the queue when a consumer is busy or fails to consume one message. You want to re-deliver fake messages later, and you may also need uh, to do scheduled or delayed message delivery as well. And what is great with Pulsar is that Pulsar has all of these features. Pulsar can process large data streams like Kafka, but Pulsar also provides message broker features just like RabbitMQ. So now you could tell, you could say, why not do that with Kafka? because Kafka is also about producing and consuming messages, right? So you may think using a streaming platform to implement a work queue is a good idea. But when I try to do that, this is how I felt. That looked a bit like this, right? Trying to fit this, this box into a one hole that it doesn't designed, it doesn't really designed for that. So let's try this together. Let's implement a simple message queue using a Kafka topic. So we start with something simple, a, sing a single consumer, and the topic will be configured with just one partition, right? So now let's say that I need to consume the queue faster because the queue is growing too quickly. Then I need to add a new worker, a new consumer to the Kafka consumer group. 
However, when you need to add a new active consumer to the same consumer group, then you need to add a new partition to the topic. For that, you need to perform an operation on the broker side, and you will also perform a rebalance of the data across the partition. This rebalance operation can be heavy and can lead to performance loss or even downtime. So this is why new partitions need to be anticipated and planned carefully when you do Kafka. But Pulsar doesn't have this issue. Now let's take another example. Here, one message always fails when consumed. So because of an invalid format, for example, or the consumer is busy processing the messages for a long time, right? Then the remaining messages in the queue are not consumed. The queue is blocked. It's normal because there is only one consumer and one worker, right? So um, let's try and take a look at the questions as in the meantime, let's discuss benefits going to tap responsibility let's say queue. Why not? Oh, we, I think we will see that. We, we, I think I will answer that in the next, uh, yeah, my next slide. Okay. okay. So, uh, fine. So, sorry, so sorry, Julian, to, to interrupt you, like you can answer the questions now, like you can do it like whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that, okay. I think I, I would prefer answer the question later because most of the time, most of the questions are, are answered uh, uh, during my talk at, at, at the next slide or the slide after. So, all right. Yeah. So let's continue and I will and answer the, the question just after. Uh, okay, so uh, you have only one worker, so the queue is blocked, and uh, this is normal because there is only one consumer here. So to solve this problem, you need to add a new consumer, so you will need to add a new partition as well on the broker side, so you run into the same issues and as before, right? To unblock this situation, you need to create a new partition. So now I have my two partitions and my two active consumers. That's great. So is the problem solved? Well, we are, about to, we are about to find out. So let's say that one message blocks the queue again, okay? Then tasks from the partition one will be processed, which is better, of course, but the partition zero is still blocked. So you have to wait for consumer zero to finish before processing the remaining tasks in partition zero. So the problem is not really solved here, right? So I intend to illustrate that using a data stream platform for message queuing is not ideal. These platforms are not designed for that. It's not the same use case, it's not the same semantics. Messaging is what message workers such as RabbitMQ, for example, are designed for, right? So why choose between messaging and streaming? Because with Pulsar, good news is that this is not a dilemma. With Pulsar, you can do both using the same platform and the same technology. So you have only one SDK to learn when you are a developer, and you have only one broker to manage in production to do both. So how is it possible for the same broker to manage both messaging and streaming? There are important concepts to understand here. So let's start with the concepts you can find in most messaging and streaming platforms. The producer sends data, right? And doesn't know about the consumer or their status and the consumer receives data from the producer and never directly interacts with the producer, right? Because all interactions go through the, the broker. They go through Pulsar and Pulsar handles all communication and the data is sent and stored on topics. So you can find this concept in most broker technologies like Kafka or RabbitMQ and Pulsar. However, Pulsar brings an additional concept this concept is the subscription. So Pulsar consumers declare how they want to consume messages and for that they connect to a subscription. The subscription specifies how consumers using the subscription will receive the topic's messages. And the subscription tracks, mm. sorry, which messages are consumed in the subscription. And one topic can have several subscriptions at the same time. That's very important. So we achieve this unified messaging and streaming use case through subscriptions. So a subscription type is a function of the consumer. The producer 
doesn't need to worry about if the use case is streaming of messaging. So these messages in the topic can be consumed in different ways. When you need to process the messages in the right order, you can use the exclusive mode. In this mode, you have only one consumer at the same time because Prusa enforces it. So we will, you will get an error if you try to add another consumer to the same subscription. So you will get the message in the right order because you only have one consumer. That's fine, but what if the consumer is down? If you can't afford to wait for this consumer to become available again, then you can use the failover mode. In that mode, when your consumer is down, then Prusa will fall back to another one and Prusa will deliver the messages to this consumer. Here we have the share mode. So with the share mode, messages will be delivered to multiple consumers. The subscription will deliver the messages to consumers in a round robin fashion. So if you need to consume messages faster, you just have to add new consumers and that's it. It's also easy to remove consumers to save resources as well. However, it's important to note that in this mode, messages may be processed in a slightly different order than they were produced, right? This is why the share mode is about messaging. The share mode works best when your consumers are workers that share the same task queue and each message is an independent task to be performed, right? So when we are talking about these different subscription modes, we talk about how some of them are most useful in messaging domains versus streaming domains. Okay, so now what if you need to scale your consumer to consume the messages as fast as possible, like the shared mode, but you still need to process the messages in the right order, so you need both then you will use the key shared mode. This mode is the same as the shared mode, but with an important difference. If the messages are produced with a key, then the messages that share the same key will be delivered to the same consumer. So you can process all the messages with the same key in the right order. You can use the suppression mode for both messaging and streaming then. And key share mode is great for scaling out consumers like the share mode, but because you have an ordering guarantee, then you can scale your streaming processing on the consumer side without creating new partitions, right? That's completely dynamic and that's pretty cool. So we just saw that Pulsar can handle both mes messaging and streaming use cases. This is one of the key features of Pulsar. Now I'd like to talk about Pulsar scalability and elasticity because scalability and elasticity are different things. Elasticity means you can grow or shrink resources quickly to adapt to workload changes. So you can save infrastructure costs by avoiding over-provisioning, right? Some data streaming platforms like Kafka and Pulsar can scale very well, but Pulsar is both scalable and elastic as well. The scalability requirements are determined by the bottleneck you have to address, right? So if your bottleneck is the number of messages remaining to be consumed in a topic, then you need to scale on the consumer side. But when the bottleneck is the number of topics or the number of connections with clients, then you need to add more processing power to the Pulsar cluster because you need to scale the cluster itself. And when the bottleneck is the storage capacity, then you need to add more storage capacity to the cluster, right? So let's delve into the first bottleneck, which is likely to be the most common one you will encounter. Suppose you have multiple consumers consuming a topic. So what happens if the number of messages to be consumed grows faster than the consumer can process them? Then with Pulsar, you just have to add new consumers to what we call the shared or key shared subscription. So you can increase the throughput by adding new consumers and that's it. With Kafka, when you need to add a new active consumer, then you need to add a new partition to the topic. And remember, you don't need that to, to scale out Pulsar consumer. And all of that while preserving the ordering warranty, unlike traditional messaging brokers. So now that we delve into the most common bottleneck, let's explore how Pulsar can handle a rapidly increasing number of consumers and producers. 
But first, I need to explain the unique architecture of Pulsar. This architecture is more sophisticated than the platform, so it brings also many benefits. In Pulsar, there are two types of nodes, the broker nodes and the bookie nodes. The broker nodes are responsible for managing all the communication and the processing of the topics, so they are stateless. They don't store data. So a broker node deletion won't impact the data, right? In contrast, the bookie nodes are responsible for storage. They have state, they store the messages. And the bookies are Apache bookkeeper nodes. So let's say that I need more processing power on my cluster. I just have to add more broker nodes. And because their state is stored in the bookkeeper tier, I, in the bookkeeper tier, I can add a new broker and that load can then be migrated to another broker. So some of the magic of Pulsar is that it will take care of all of the moving of those connections and the moving is transparent to your application, to the consumer and the producers. If you, if you compare this with Kafka and adding a new broker, I would have to manage the movement of all the data to another broker for it to rebalance across, node, across nodes to rebalance it, right? And there is no heavy partition here. There is no heavy partition rebalance here and no data movement involved when you add a new broker node in Pulsar. And when we need to store more data this time, then we just add more bookies. As soon as you add a new bookie, it's going to be eligible for getting new messages right away. It immediately becomes functional and there is no data rebalance. So Pulsar does not have this issue when you need scalability on your data. So here is a quick recap of the three levels of elasticity and the benefits compared to other streaming platforms. When you do data streaming or messaging, your most common bottleneck is the consumer. And the advantage of Pulsar is that scaling consumer doesn't require complex operations like adding partitions on the broker side. If your bottleneck is the processing power, you just have to add new broker nodes without the need for data movement across nodes. And finally, if storage capacity is the limiting factor, then adding new bookies nodes resolves the issue. And unlike other platforms, these nodes immediately receive new messages. And of course, you can also easily downscale to save on infrastructure cost. And to ease the use of Pulsar in a Kubernetes environment, three native developed Kubernetes operators. So these operators facilitate the deployment of Pulsar cluster on Kubernetes. You can define your desired cluster configuration using, you know, those familiar Kubernetes manifest files, right? And this allows for seamless scaling and facilitate the installation of additional components as well. So you can find the documentation on the Stream Native website, and Stream Native offers these operators under a simple and free-to-use community license. So I just presented how you can scale Pulsar with its multi-layered architecture which is the second key feature of Pulsar. Now let's talk about the third feature, durability. Topics are made of segments in Pulsar, and these segments contain the messages. Pulsar can distribute the segments to separate bookies, and this is how a single topic is distributed across several data nodes. It's important to note that the storage model is completely different from the Kafka storage model, which is partition-based and not segment-based. Here you have in my, in my diagram, here you have a replication factor of three. So every segment is replicated on three different bookies. So if I kill one bookie, for example, the bookie two, I still have all the segments in the other bookies, so I haven't lost any data. You may need to store a big amount of data and retaining for a long time, depending on your use case. So you'll need to read the old messages that were produced days or even months ago. With Pulsar, you can offload those messages to external storage. So instead of using our fast and expensive disk in the cluster nodes, we can rather leverage the use of third-party cloud storage systems, moving this data into a more cost-effective storage tier, right? And this is transparent for the consumer. So if you need to replay a topic, for example, some mes messages will be read from the cloud storage and other messages will be read from the bookie. But the consumer doesn't see this, it's transparent. And this offloading is facilitated by this segment-based architecture that I just presented. Because this architecture allows older data segments to be offloaded seamlessly. 
So we've seen what happens when you lose a node, but what if you lose a whole region or a data center, right? That's where geo-replication steps in. Geo-replication provides disaster recovery. So you have several clusters deployed in different regions or different data center. And if you lose a region, you can recover from it. Pulsar can replicate the data to different regions automatically and in a bi-directional way. And this is a built-in feature. So setting this up is basically about configuration. Now I'd like to introduce another very cool, very cool feature of Pulsar, the multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy allows different departments or teams within, within an organization to share a Pulsar cluster while keeping their data isolated. So multi-tenancy helps applications work in a shared environment by providing, you know, security, structure, and resource isolation, that's important. And the benefits include easier management because you only need to operate one single cluster for multiple teams. Plus, sharing resources can lead to a significant reduction in the number of nodes in your infrastructure, which can save on cost. And this is not a hack or another layer on top of Pulsar. Pulsar is designed for that. This is a built-in feature. So now you could say, uh, well, Julien, Pulsar has impressive features, but you know, in my company, I have an existing software ecosystem. I'm sending or consuming messages with Kafka and RabbitMQ, and I have a bunch of microservices and I can't rewrite all of them. Well, I have good news for you because Pulsar has a high level of compatibility. And I explain that right now. So you remember this, right? The producer, the consumers, etc. Well, to use the broker, this producer and consumer don't have to use the Pulsar protocol. So you can have producer that are using the Kafka protocol and producing to a Pulsar topic, and you don't have to change the code of these producers because Pulsar has a compatibility layer, a protocol handler that is compatible with Kafka. That's the same for RabbitMQ and MQTT protocol. And you can do the same with consumers. You can make them believe that they are consuming a Kafka topic or a RabbitMQ message queue, but they are consuming a Pulsar topic. And the magic is that all of that works at the same time with the same topics. So you can integrate Kafka compatible apps with RabbitMQ compatible apps with Pulsar using only one single broker. And to write client applications, using this time the native Pulsar protocol, you can you have many Pulsar client libraries available. You will surely find one for your favorite, favorite language. And don't hesitate to check out hub.streamnative.io, hub.streamnative.io, where you will find a wide ecosystem of connectors, libraries, protocol handlers, etc. Pulsar has also a great open source community. So all these features are available in open source. So if you download Pulsar, you will have all of them. And this is great because you don't depend on a specific vendor. So you're free to call a vendor to provide a Pulsar as a service like Stream Native, or you can manage a Pulsar cluster by yourself. There is no vendor locked in. So a quick history. Pulsar was developed by Yahoo in 2012 as their cloud messaging service. It then went open source in 2016. And by 2018, Pulsar had graduated to a top-level Apache project. And since, let's say, 2019, there's, a been, there's been a surge in the Pulsar community's growth with rapid adoption and an increasing number of contributors. It's worth mentioning that Pulsar has been in production for over 10 years. So it, it means that Pulsar is a battle-tested technology, right? It's proven technology now. So some data of on the Pulsar open source community. There's more than 600 contributors to Pulsar and there are more making contributions to the ecosystem surrounding around Pulsar. The entire Pulsar code base in growing, is growing year over year. And the number of Slack members, which reach 10,000. And additionally, there are now one around 1,000 of organizations using Pulsar. 
So here is a quick recap. Prusar is a unified messaging and streaming platform handling both patterns, both semantics at the same time. So you have only one platform to manage. Prusar is doing great at both scaling and being elastic and provide three levels of elasticity. Prusar ensures the durability of the data and can offload to external cheap and unlimited storage. Pulsar has geo-replication built-in, which is great for disaster recovery. Pulsar is natively multi-tenant. Pulsar is compatible with your software ecosystem, and all these great features are available as open source, so you have no vendor locked in. All right, so that's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it, so feel free to scan this QR code to contact me. I'll be very happy to, and to get access to additional resources. Um, I can also share the link on the chat. And uh, yes, I will do that in a few seconds. So, well, feel free to try out Pulsar by downloading it or by signing up for Stream Native Private Cloud. Uh, that's our managed offer. And uh, well, uh, I guess that we'll. Pe can people ask questions right now? Yes, or and you have like a lot of questions already. Like oh, yeah, down. I can see that. Yeah. Okay. I'm Let a recap. I can see them. Yeah, some are recaps, more like some are questions. So shall we first open the ones in Q&A tab? Okay, um, there are six questions. So can this benefits of combining two tabs from system to system to queue in Pulsar when can them separate when they're in Pulsar and Pulsar? So I said Q is just one type of input source or open sync. So that's the uh, question um, asked by Devon Shu. Different between segment and passing base. Okay. Uh, the first question is quite uh, is will be quite long to answer. So Devan should don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll be happy to discuss with you about that because I'm afraid that can take much time to to answer. Um, same for different between segment and person based storage scheme. I think that I'd answer that question through my slides. If it wasn't clear, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly using this QR code of this link, and I'll be very happy to, to delve into this with you. Uh, how is this compared to a Solace offer? I'm, I don't know Solace enough to answer that question, so I'm going to skip it, sorry. Any way to increase volume? Oh, sorry. That's fine, right, that's just on us. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> sorry about the volume issues. Volume was OK. OK, great. Hi, I'm Farad. Hello, Farad. Nice to meet you. I want to know about Pulsar because I have the experience of working with Kafka, but I'm not with Pulsar nonetheless, my curiosity. What are the key distinctions between Pulsar and Kafka in terms of architecture that give Pulsar some capabilities compared to Kafka? I think that that question may be asked before uh, my slide about the architecture uh, because I presented this, ar this architecture. So if it's not enough or if you need more information, Farad, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, will be we could also go more into details about this architecture. Um, and same for knowing more regarding the ecosystem and community support on Pulsar as compared to Kafka. I think that I already answered that question, but don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, can we talk about limitation of Pulsar as well? What will be the limitation of Pulsar? That's a very good question. Um, I didn't observe any limitation of Pulsar. I will say that I can refer this question uh, like that. Um, this question could also be uh, why should I, what is the, what would be the reason not to use Pulsar? I will say that Pulsar comes with a very sophisticated architecture, right? So you, you need this architecture when you need to provide, for example, one single cluster for different departments in your company, right? But if you have a very small team with very basic needs, then Prusa may be overkill for you. So it depends on, on your use case and your context. That will be maybe a limitation, sort of. Uh, okay, can you talk about comparison with Prusa ecosystem and Snowflake? Uh, okay, oh, that will be a long, <laughs> very long answer. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip it and leave some room to, uh, to tune. Uh, can Prusa and Watts and link to Iceberg, Delta, and Hundi? Yes, we have several connectors that are able to read and write to Iceberg, Delta, and Hundi. Don't hesitate to check out hub.unity.io. And I think uh, I don't, I'm not aware of 100% of all the connectors because it's such a huge ecosystem, but 
I'm pretty confident that we have an iceberg and a delta connector. Um, all right, I guarantee message order. Does Pulsar also offer that? Yes, Pulsar guaranteed message order, as I said. Um, if you if you use the exclusive or failover subscription modes, or if you use the key share subscription mode when uh, your producer is able to send messages using a key, then you uh, will have an ordering message guarantee, an ordering guarantee. Is there any application of a Pulsar, like say Confluent of a Kafka? Oh, you mean the uh, um, managed service provider, right? Like Confluent of a Kafka. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we can say that Stream Native is to Pulsar what Confluent is to Kafka, basically, because we provide managed services. So we, we, we provide the managed Pulsar. Uh, that can run on uh, our infrastructure, so as a software as a service, and we can also uh, help you run your Pulsar um, and manage your Pulsar on your own infrastructure, so on-prem or your own or your own cloud as well. Are there hardware optimization tips to further enhance Pulsar performance? Uh, yes, but uh, <laughs> that's also a very, a very complex question because all depends on your on your context. So don't hesitate to to reach out to me to provide more uh, about your context, and I can help you. All right. Uh, can you just take a look at the the chat? Like there is one or two that are not in that are not the same as in q and a you can just take a look at the chat on the right yes um, I have. so i'm going i'm just reading that sorry there are so many questions yeah <laughs> sorry Tun. So, and thank you so much by all your for all your questions by the way that's very interesting uh, what is bigger uh, compared to Kafkaesque? Uh, I don't know Kafka is very well so i won't run into a comparison uh, but uh, Oh yes, if I if I recall correctly, Kafka is a kind of, imp of a queuing implementation on top of Kafka, right? Uh, if that's Kafka esque, then uh, I would say that Pulsar is natively designed from the beginning to behave like a message queue. So that's not something on top of Kafka, right? With uh, all the limitations that it that it can have, Pulsar is natively designed to do message queuing, right? That's that, that's not something on top or an additional components compared to Kafka plus Kafkaesque. Uh, if the Kafka is passing segment in different... In the Kafka is passing segment, are there all segments is different in Kafka and plus... I'm sorry, I'm not sure to, un to understand the question. Uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me to the QR code and I can answer. Um, can you please talk about limitation of Pulsar as well? I, uh, that's I the, yeah, already that's answered this one. And uh, yeah, I already answered those ones. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> now I will, I, I will uh, let. Uh, we just need to, to give some space to Tune. Thank you, Tune. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for thank being here. No worries. Um, yeah, really love this presentation, Julian. Um, the thing I like about Julian going first is he's already explained um, streaming, so I don't I can remove those <laughs> slides because right. normally, right. <laughs> like when you see a few of these uh, talks like back to back, you see like the same material. So I'm I'm glad I can remove some of those and don't have to elaborate on them. So that's that's great. So thank you for that. All right, shall I yes. shall I get going, Joanna? Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. I'm going to share my screen now. So. Thank you, everybody, for joining this session. Um, this is a new talk. I created this very recently, and I just um, this is going to be more of a thinking piece, I guess, and more about like kind of how you kind of think about serverless and event-driven architecture and how you deal with it. So um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Hopefully, we'll have some fun with this. Um, let's see. Is my screen share working? Okay, is it working? It is Let working. Me try again. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on two screens here, but like it's kind of okay. doing something very strange. Let me try and fix this. Sorry, one sec. Um, so I've got a second screen, so it's just showing me very bizarre things. And initially, so it worked again. well. So just do what you did the first time. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, right, let me just set this up. I did the first time. And it should be here. Okay, sharing again. Okay. 
Okay, now I think it's working. Okay, sorry about that. Bit of technical difficulty. So thanks everyone for joining. This one's called Faster Event-Driven Architecture with Apache Kafka, Python, and Quix. So uh, my name's Tun Shui. I'm the VP of data. I work at Quix. And uh, in my past life, I was a head of data and a data engineer. So I helped companies um, dream up and implement their data strategy with streaming technologies at the forefront. Um, so I was able to build wonderful applications uh, that use a lot of AI and um, also streaming and um, analytics platforms. So um, you address the business intelligence in the company. My passion is um, no surprise around event-driven real-time streaming technologies. And uh, I'm a big fan of all things audio and music because I play guitar. So I love that intersection of software and music and audio. So if that's you, um, please connect with me. Um, you'll find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to build things with you. Um, also a film fan. So um, I really love movies. I go to cinema a lot. You're going to see some movie references in here. Hopefully some of them from not too long ago that you'll recognize them. And my belief is that um, we should have a new normal where data is processed as soon as it's generated. Um, oftentimes we introduce a delay um, before we read the data and um, process it. And I think we should live in a world where as soon as that data is generated or created, that we process it and do something with it. So it has the most value. Uh, I believe in less is more and that you should get started sooner. So I think you should always start simple. So the theme of serverless really resonates with me. I think rather than trying to build a team and build infrastructure yourself to start off with serverless components, is a great way to get started. And uh, you can do that soon. You can do that today. So a bit about Quix, um, it comes from an F1 racing background. So again, the faster theme, uh, those are the four uh, co-founders. They come from an F1 background. They work for McLaren Racing. So uh, they're used to a very low latency, highly critical environment with lots of data flying around. Um, this is probably how I got hired at Quix. Um, I like to get into fast cars occasionally as well and go racing. Um, so that's probably why. But what does fast mean in this context of serverless? We don't really talk about um, Kafka in streaming being slow, we know that's fast, but what does fast mean in event-driven architecture land? Um, so I'm going to pull up the first movie reference here, which is from The Fast and the Furious. Um, so Vin Diesel plays a, a character called Dominic Toretto, um, and for him, he has this famous quote. He says, ask any racer, any real racer, it doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile, winning's winning. So it's purely about going fast. He's talking about higher acceleration, higher velocity to win in a race. Um, and Dominic has the skills of a mechanic, but for the most part, he was the one in the driving seat. So in our world, he would be the developer. He would be the one writing the code. But who was maintaining the engine and making sure that the code could run on the machine and that every the machinery was even working correctly? It was this guy, Jesse. Um, but everyone forgets about Jesse. Everyone remembers Dominic because... Um, no one wants to be the person maintaining the machinery. Everyone wants to be the person in the driving seat. So um, I've learned that when you're trying to sell on the benefits of event streaming technologies, you have to sell the benefits of being able to go fast. But in this terms, going fast means going fast from your idea that's in your head to the market, to getting in front of your customers. And going from idea to market in the developer's world is going from code running on your local machine to code running in production as quickly as possible. So the meaning of fast in this context is developing and deploying fast. I'm going to go into a little history of serverless, because um, in the beginning, um, there was cloud. Um, and before that was a company called Amazon. And what they did was uh, back in 2002, they launched AWS. Um, so this is roughly when cloud emerged. And um, you have to have cloud before you can have serverless. So Amazon launched AWS in 2002. Sorry, I wasn't able to find screenshots of Amazon back in 2002. But what I could find was there was some uh, 2002 was an interesting time for movies. So the first Spider-Man film was released. And so was the film Minority Report, um, which made a lot of UI designers really excited and influenced them for like generations. Um, and so, so now these were um, these were what was released in 2002. Um, people are also excited about the Star Wars movies, but less excited about uh, the second part of the second prequel, which is Attack of the Clones. But we get to make memes with Anakin and Padme now, so all is forgiven. Um, here's a slide that um, so Jeff Barr, who is currently the VP and Chief Evangelist at AWS. 
he created um, this slide, which he used in presentations back in 2002. And this is prior to him starting his role as a web services evangelist for Amazon. And it looks really simple. Um, it's basically how a web service works. A client goes through the internet to the server and the results are returned to the client. Um, it looks really simple, but this is how consulting businesses made money back in the early 2000s. So early web services were the AI and the LLMs of today, you could, you could say. So Amazon started AWS because they were an absolute powerhouse. So they set out to um, create a large e-commerce uh, store and they realized that they needed to improve their efficiency to serve all their customers. And um, their unfair advantage was that they had created this infrastructure themselves and they were able to manage it and scale it out reliably and efficiently. Um, but the problem was back in 2002, it was, you know, it was still very early days. They didn't really thought through and thought about the impact for the future. So AWS back in 2002 was just a bunch of like disparate tools that didn't really join together. It was largely for kind of like affiliate marketing and analytics. So it wasn't very useful. Um, so um, like Jeff Bezos got involved, a few few members of leadership got involved and they rethought the whole concept of web, of web services and they rebooted it and explored it again in 2003. And they arrived at this concept of the operating system of the internet where different hardware resources are isolated. Um, so in our cases, we're talking about compute, storage, memory, et cetera. They were all abstracted and isolated and uh, they're abstracted as components for developers to use as much or as little as they needed um, on demand. So after a few years of um, different private launches in 2004, they launched SQS. Um, notably SQS is a simple queue service. It's um, it's not really a database, it's a queue, which is interesting that they launched with that first. So they were already thinking about data in motion. Um, then in 2006, they launched two more uh, public web services. So S3 was the first one. We know about um, the, the storage, the box, the, the object storage of S3 and EC2, which is elastic compute. So it was essentially um, elastic servers in the cloud. So they did data in motion first, then infinitely scalable data at rest and then compute. And you know, the rest is history because today now they have hundreds of services. Um, and speaking of history, uh, today we would download these SDKs. So, you know, AWS is for developers. It was built for developers and we would download SDKs of the internet, but back then um, they would distribute them on CD like this. So there's Amazon Web Services SDK 2.0. And so now we're in this position where we have lots of cloud vendors to choose from. So you've got AWS, you've got Google Cloud Platform, you've got um, Microsoft Azure, Oracle Cloud, Alibaba, Cloudflare, Tencent Cloud. Um, there's even more actually. Um, these are the common ones that have the most market share and the most market share is concentrated in those top three anyway. But what they provide you, you know, they're, they're all still just servers. You still have to look after them. So um, before managed services such as Amazon RDS for PostgreSQL came along, you had to spin up on Amazon an, an, an EC2 server. Then you had to, you know, SSH into that server and then install and configure Postgres yourself and then do all the networking to make it become available. So what you had was servers absolutely everywhere. And um, cloud services did mean provisioning of components. Um, so you needed a better abstraction. Um, and, you know, servers do mean work for developers. Like you have to do work. Um, and what we learned over time was that um, what it boiled down to is developers wanted to connect their data to code that they could run without any of the headaches of learning how to provision servers. Didn't want to have to, you know, SSH into a box to install software for dependencies. Uh, think about observability, configuring, monitoring. them. So developers wanted to live in that future where you could just write code and have it run. So the concept of serverless was born. And, um, you know, we've got cloud functions um, like FAST, which is functions as a service, all these concepts were born and it just all began with a simple thing which was serverless compute so each of those cloud vendors have a serverless compute product um, and it is really the backbone of serverless event-driven architecture so aws went first with lambda that was back in 2014 and then azure cloud functions and google cloud functions followed in 2016 followed by a raft of others so um, vercel functions exist cloudflare have something called cloudflare workers netlify have functions as well so we have serverless compute you can write logic in any in any number of supported programming languages and you have a way to deploy them to a serverless environment so let's talk briefly on the benefits of serverless so um yeah, these are the bullet points here. So uh, the benefits are really that 
um, the, the main benefit is the management of service has been delegated. So developers can now run code without managing service. And it's done in an elastic way that allows um, automatic uh, adapt adaptation to the workloads. So AWS Lambda, which I'll take as an example, because um, AWS is the one I'm most familiar with, it supports several programming languages. Um, when, when it was launched, it was just Node.js, but now you've got you know Go, you've got Python, you've got Java and many more. And um, the thing is, um, Lambdas can be triggered by AWS services or other external applications. Um, so you've got that elastic scalability. Um, you also have PAYG uh, pricing, which is pay-as-you-go pricing. So they optimize for the cost um, in serverless by allocating the necessary resources to handle the traffic. And you only have to pay for the time of code execution. Uh, which is great. So, so when the code isn't being executed, you don't pay. So some vendors such as AWS, um, there was a time when they charged to the nearest 100 milliseconds, but today they have single millisecond metering, so you can keep the cost down really low. Um, it's low latency um, because serverless works on demand. Um, they're great for building event-driven applications. So responding to events, um, it's just much, it's a much faster experience because you can process data in real time, um, you know, close to when it's created. And you reduce um, the latency further um, because you're able to deploy in different um, geographical locations. So depending on, um, I think we have some of our attendees here in Asia, you would um, use some of the regions over that way in Asia Pacific, and that would make your local application faster. Um, so you've got also faster deployments and updates um, because you don't have to manage and look after servers. You don't need to configure them. You can just deploy your code. Your code is the package. It's the, it's the thing that you ship and will deploy. And um, that's all you need to do to release the application. And uh, largely, um, and lastly, sorry, the rich ecosystem support. So um, a lot of these cloud vendors have a lot of other services that plug together in a very nice way. And um, this rich ecosystem allows you to build different types of applications depending on your business. Um, and at Quix, we often talk about the art of the possible. So I usually like to include a slide that shows the art of the possible here. So with serverless, um, the example here is this is a Coca-Cola freestyle machine. Um, what it does is it's it's kind of magical, really. It magically dispenses your drink of choice through this clever technology where it mixes different flavors using um, like kind of cartridges. Because um, in the old days, you would use like syrup and kind of CO2 gas, but this is like a new way of doing it. It's like kind of um, better control over quantities and like uh, ratios of gas, etc. So what AWS did was um, AWS and uh, Coca-Cola partnered up and um, they worked together to um, utilize serverless technologies to build a touch-free experience for the Coca-Cola retail partners. So what um, they did was they created an infrastructure and an app that um, allowed you to scan a QR code to get a menu of the drinks available on that machine on your mobile device. Then you tap the drink that you'd like to dispense, and then there's a button that you press and hold, and then it would pour your drink for you. So when we're talking about real-time pouring of drinks, you can imagine um, that you need low latency here. So uh, the serverless application needs to respond to milliseconds rather than tens or hundreds of milliseconds, since um, one of the main requirements is to respond to you know, a user's interaction as fast as possible. You don't want the drink to overflow in the cup. Um, so with serverless and um, AWS Lambda, um, Coca-Cola were able to go faster and they developed a prototype within one week. Um, within 100 days, they were in production in the market with 500 machines and about a month, uh, a month later, 10,000 machines and a few months later, all the machines, which are around 52,000 machines. So they're able to build really quickly, deploy and scale it out really quickly as well. So they were able to go to market really quickly with this new and novel idea. But there are drawbacks to serverless. Um, so you have to give up a lot of control over your server. Um, you get what's provided by the vendor with the abstraction that they've, choose, they've chosen, and that's what you have to deal with. Um, so serverless isn't always suitable for long processes as well, especially in the case of AWS Lambda, because you'll rack up really large bills because you're paying as you go. Um, and you may also be restricted um, to a maximum duration. So with AWS Lambda, it's 15 minutes. So if you want a, anything longer than that, you have to pick a different technology. You've got reduced security and privacy. Um, usually with serverless, um, the containers are all uh, multi-tenant. So what that means is you're sharing resources with other accounts uh, of that uh, vendor. And this affects safety because if you use things in your application like local storage, there's a chance that that data could be read by external parties if you're not careful. 
Um, serverless containers may need warming up. So there's a cold start problem. So if you're using certain um, programming languages like Java that rely on um, like a JVM, that needs to warm up. So um, how a lot of uh, serverless works is the containers are in a pool. And when you um, request, um, um, when you invoke an application there, it picks one out of the pool. And if it picks a new one, that new um, container may need warming up and that affects performance as well. Um, you could have vendor lock-in because there's um, code. the code written is usually specific to the vendor and there isn't really open standards here. So if you decide to migrate to another vendor, there may be code rewrites needed. And uh, lastly, it's, it can be difficult to debug and test. So uh, because you've got all these different components, there are lots of different places to look. Um, you're not able to you know, log onto the servers and see logs. You have to just use the tools that you're given uh, to observe and figure out what's going on. And um, um, you can't always um, spin up that container locally either. You have to test it using some sort of dev or test environment in the cloud. So now that we've talked a bit about serverless, let's talk about uh, Kafka itself. Um, we want to leverage the power of the data that's created and processed in real time. And we know that Kafka is a mature solution here. Um, it's been around for over a decade. Um, and I also made this um, this I do one push up meme after I sat down and tried to remember all those times I tried to introduce streaming technology to engineering and leadership teams. Uh, the one thing I learned is that they don't care about how fast Kafka is or that streaming is faster than micro batching. Like speed doesn't seem to matter. What teams generally care about is um, you know having to manage Kafka. Like having to manage it is is the difficulty. There are so many components, so many ways to configure it. That is the thing that loses people. And we know that um, having that real hardware abstracted away from developers creates a better developer experience. Um, developers don't want to have to provision a bare bones EC2 instance and install Kafka on it and then configure it and monitor it. They want serverless Kafka. So um, that gave rise to um, different products. Um, so with AWS, you have MSK, which is managed um, streams for Kafka. Um, you've got Google with PubSub, you've got Azure with HD Insight. Um, there are some, there are, you know, newer breed um, of kind of cloud native Kafka focused companies as well coming out. Um, one of whom is Confluent Cloud, who were the original creators of Apache Kafka. You've got Ivan, who managed lots of different open source solutions. And recently we had Upstash, who offered um, a managed Kafka as well. And so let's go into a bit about the benefits of serverless Kafka. So um, it, it inherits all the same benefits as serverless compute. So the, the previous slide, all of that. But the main benefit is around the one-click provisioning with sensible defaults and that delegated management of, of your Kafka cluster. So it's um, with these cloud vendors and uh, serverless Kafka, you have the brokers taken care of for you. You have a schema registry, a HTTP proxy. Um, you have Zookeeper, Kraft, all the different consensus um, ways of dealing with uh, leader election, all that is taken care of you and managed by the service. And of course, there are drawbacks. Um, what's the main drawback? <laughs> that it's in the cloud. So um, in an effort to make the developer experience better, that configuration is usually really simplified. So you don't have control over some of the Kafka configuration, which leads to maybe features missing in, in you know, the infrastructure and the applications that you need. So for example, some of the vendors don't support log compaction or um, they have size-based retention or they don't expose like the HTTP Kafka API itself. So you're kind of restricted in how you build. But still, serverless Kafka and serverless compute are a real marriage made in heaven. They go together really well. Um, so talking about deployments as well. So once that code is running on your machine, um, your local machine, how do you get it into the cloud? How do you get it into the serverless Kafka instance? Um, up until 2020, the way to deploy um, in the example of AWS Lambda was using zip file archives. So you had to you know, create a zip file in a certain standardized way and upload it that way. So um, in 2020, AWS um, added support for deployment with Docker container images. And that's kind of become the de facto way of how you deploy your code onto um, serverless Kafka these days. So moving from the local machine to deploying to a cloud, it's often a difficult step. Um, you've got to think about packaging up the code. Um, in you know, many cases, you have to publish the image somewhere. You have to go through like a CI CD pipeline to do that, to deploy it and release it to your customers. And um, this is where Quicks came in. Um, so we're, we're focused around Python. Um, so uh, a lot of the ecosystem around streaming and um, Kafka is based in Java. And we wanted to bring um, that experience to Python developers. 
Um, so the first product that we have is the Quix uh, Screams, which is the open source Python client library. It's a way for you to process the data in Kafka using pure Python. And you can, um, if you already use Python and you are familiar with um, libraries like Pandas or NumPy, your favorite libraries, um, you can bring them with you and use them alongside Quix Streams. And our serverless solution is Quix Cloud. So it's the platform where you can have everything managed for you. The managed Kafka, um, the um, CI CD pipeline, the deployment, everything is one click, makes it really super simple. And uh, Quix uh, does it this way. Um, we kind of have an open way of um, building on top of Quix. So we've made um, Kafka available to you. So if you are running your own managed Kafka, whether it's MSK or Confluent Cloud, you can bring your own Kafka. Um, you can bring your own Git as well. So you can configure your own Git repos inside of Quix. So in an open way, you can start um, like bringing in code that you already have. And we have um, a lot of open source connectors. So we have sources and destinations that are all open source uh, Python. So to get started, it's really simple. And um, Quix, uh, you know, it exists uh, for the reasons I kind of mentioned before, like building your own architecture is really costly. Um, to build infrastructure from scratch, oftentimes when I um, start, um, in, when I was consulting and um, I arrived at a company and they wanted to find value from data, they had to build infrastructure. And to do that, oftentimes they had to invest in building a team. And, you know, hiring takes months and months and months and scaling up um, and building prototypes can take many months. And then to release it, to observe it can take weeks after that. So there's a huge cost and risk associated for a business, but also the developer experience of having to upskill and manage these services like, isn't always ideal, especially when you're starting out and trying to prove out a business. And so Quix accelerates that application development. So using the power of serverless Kafka and serverless compute, we allow you to develop and build things within weeks. Um, you'll find um, like when you sign up for a trial, um, there's very few clicks that you need to have your own environment ready with a serverless Kafka and a serverless compute environment where you write code. And um, this is a screenshot of what Quix looks like. Um, so we have the concept of a cloud IDE, so you can actually collaborate with um, other developers inside um, the IDE there. Um, and you'll see um, on the right there, what you're seeing is actually a Kafka Streams app. Um, and this is how you deal with streaming data. Um, it works really well because um, it's with, with serverless architecture and event-driven architecture, your application is designed to run code in response to triggers, like when data comes in, like when you respond to an event. So you'll see here at the top there that Quix has this concept of handlers. And what you do is you attach handlers to in your application so that when data comes in, it invokes that handler and we inject in as arguments, um, anything you might need. For example, you know, you might need a certain context or um, an access to data frames that are coming in. So you were able to do that. So you can work in data frames natively. And um, I should say, we just released Quick Streams 2 into Alpha this week as well, and we added stateful functions. So now you can create aggregations such as um, if you want to sum, do a min, max, or an average over a selection of data, you can do that and you can retain that state because we're able to save the state for you. Um, and um, I, I, I advise you to check it out. We're actively de developing this library and next month we're going to deliver more features such as rolling window functions so you can support and perform window calculations over different window types such as, such as tumbling and sliding windows. And um, additionally, serverless architecture can be really good for continuous um, integration and continuous uh, delivery projects. So for CI CD, you can build out this pipeline. Um, you can update the code in production instantaneously by editing it and hitting a deploy button. So we make that really easy for developers. And the last section here is really about the future of serverless. Um, what is the future of event-driven architecture? Um, I'll pause here to take a drink whilst you read what Ryan Boyd is saying. So Ryan Boyd is um, co-founder of uh, Mother Duck. They provide you the a uh, serverless version of DuckDB, which is a pop popular database that's um, emerging and being deployed like so much these days. Um, so Ryan believed that, well, he worked on BigQuery and he saw that this whole big data revolution was coming. So to support all the big data that companies are gonna generate, the petabytes of data, what we need to do is ramp up um, our capability around compute to make our machines more powerful. So you can see that the max memory capacity has increased 400 times in the last 10 years. Um, so we've got a lot of memory, we've got a lot of power. And you know, if you 
if you use um, if, if you're coding on laptops like from Apple and from Microsoft, all these companies, they've done the same thing. They've amped up um, their RAM um, and their memory needs. So you can always get really powerful machines. So what we have is we have powerful machines right in front of us locally. And um, we need to start leveraging that more. And that will allow us to iterate faster and to develop applications faster because, you know, to debug on your machine, that's just much easier. You just get to develop applications much faster by using your own machine. And the future of serverless is really building the tooling and that capability to get that code, that same code packaged transparently and available in the cloud, like in, in, in a transparent manner really quickly. That's the real future. Um, there's an article that comes from Mother Duck called Big Data is Dead. I you know, I advise you and read that one. That one's um, got a really good thought piece in there too. So um, the take home there is fast iterations, developing locally and getting it deployed really simply. Um, so, you know, designing around that is how companies will win the, the future of serverless. Um, so uh, to make all of that easier to remember, <laughs> so this is a meme from the show South Park. It's from an episode called Gnomes, where there are these gnomes that uh, steal underpants and they claim to be business experts. Um, so they're actually terrible at business, but they gave the world, uh, or rather the meme world, the three-phase business plan template to profit. So you've probably seen different versions of this. So I'm going to take that and uh, apply what I think is the future of serverless, which is phase one, you, de you develop locally, phase two, you deploy quickly, and phase three, you profit. So thanks so much for your attention. Um, um, I'm going to dip in and answer some of your questions, but I'll leave this slide up. So um, you can get quick, quick start IO. We have um, $300 of free credits and a 30-day free, tr free trial for you to really get to try it out. And we've got loads of code samples and tutorials to get you started. And um, those are the links there. Um, so yeah, please join our Slack community as well. That's the best way to get hold of me and the team. So if you have any questions around streaming, serverless Kafka, you know, writing um, applications in Python for real time, um, just drop into our, our Slack and ask away and we'll be happy to help you. So thanks everyone. Thanks Toon. I don't know if you still have that hard stop <laughs> eight minutes ago. Oh, no, that's cool. Yeah, I shuffled some things around, so it should okay. be good. Thanks okay. for that. Sorry, I mean, people are already kind of leaving. We're like a little bit like uh, over the, the time. Uh, there is one question in Q&A, and I think it's one of um, our interns. So if you can take oh, nice. a look. Okay. All right. This is from Fahad. Thanks for your question. So, right. I'm going to read it out. It's quite long. I want to know how does the event-driven nature of serverless computing align with the principles of stream processing and what unique opportunities does it create? Could you please share your perspective in the context of Quicks? What are the trade-offs between serverless and container-based approaches, particularly for stream processing, and when should we choose one over the other? Okay, um, I think, Fahad, you should join the community for sure. Like, join our Slack group. We can chat some more. Um, but in short... Um, yeah, like it, it was kind of like what I said right at the end there around um, you're developing code. You want to be able to take that code and have it run really easily. Um, and oftentimes with um, a lot of these cloud vendors like AWS, you have all these other steps to get there. Um, like I mentioned, the, the de facto way is to containerize your code. So you've got to you know, create a Docker file. You need to um, essentially um, create a, a nice, neat package that you can then, um, you know, publish to um, a registry somewhere. And then you instruct um, the cloud provider to, you know, download that image and deploy it. So there's all these steps. Um, in Quix, we try to make that bit really seamless. Um, you're essentially writing code in an editor or you're pulling in your code through a GitHub repository uh, based on kind of like guidelines we've set. Um, but we're hoping that um, for us, the future is that people will start adopting kind of the structure that we choose our approach. And so very soon, hopefully, uh, people will start thinking about, you know, we need to create a standard where we can connect GitHub repos that are formatted a certain way into a system that will know exactly what to do with it, such as containerizing it and uh, deploying it. So um, I think that's kind of like the future and that's kind of like the ethos of Quix. Um, and also um, we, we, we strive to become more open. So you'll see that we are, you know, in one of my slides, we, we are built on Kubernetes, we're built on um, Git and we're built on Kafka, we want to enable our customers to bring their own if they are managing it. So oftentimes you have, um, you know, we've got different types of customers. Some of the customers have platform teams already. And so what they want to do is they want to manage their own um, 
Kafka cluster. They want to manage their own version of the Quix platform, and we enable them to do that. So um, you can pick and choose as you want. So I think that flexibility is also um, part of the power of serverless, really. So that's those are kind of like our missions, and that's how it aligns with our future. Uh, okay, Fad, thank you for that. You got another. Sorry. You have one more technical, or you want to talk about your guitar? <laughs> right, I don't have my guitar here. Um, yeah, right, I'll answer the question. About your Maybe guitar. you have it back on. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm, I'm in the Q and A still. So uh, Fahad is asking. Um, so in the context of data science and machine learning, unique features compared to other Java. Okay. So, um, so the question was really around in the context of data science. What does this mean? So in the Quicks ecosystem, everything's in Python. So um, that makes it easier for data scientists to deal with it because that's the predominant language in data science. We have turnkey integration with Hugging Face. So um, Hugging Face has become really the place, uh, much like where everyone puts their code into GitHub, Hugging Face is the place where uh, data scientists dip, um, put their trained models in um, to make available to everyone else. So uh, we have turnkey integration with that. So we're able to allow you to configure um, um, configure using our Hugging Face connector, which um, model you'd like to deploy, and we're able to do that all transparently for you. So you can start building really good machine learning inference pipelines um, out of the gate um, within minutes if you have kind of like a model in mind. So um, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Um, again, like if you join us that group um, and like introduce yourself, um, we're able to help you more and we're happy to answer all your questions. Um, okay, so I'll close the Q&A. We've got chat, <laughs> so what's going on in the chat? Um, um, Anna Ken is yeah, asking what guitar now. do you play? Telly. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is like really, yeah. Join the community. We'll talk guitars or, uh, or, uh, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I do have a Telly. I also have a jazz master. So um, for anyone familiar with that, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Fender fan. So I've got a few guitars, but yeah, please do. Um, and we can talk about pe pedals as well. So yeah, please do join and connect with me. Great. Thanks, thanks, Toon. Like, uh, thanks everyone who stayed like twelve more minutes. Uh, thank you uh, again. Just to to make sure, will you be able to share the slides? We got those questions. Are you sharing the slides or not? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, I can maybe um add some more detail around some of the dates, some of the things that I said. Um, I'll put in okay. the slides themselves as well. So I'll do yeah. that. Let me know if you want to share the slides. They will be uploaded uh, on the meetup page for everyone who's still here. And um, yeah, and uh, the video will be sent to everyone who asked. Thanks once again, we have to wrap this up. Um, it was really like um, two amazing talks and hope to see you soon. Okay, thanks everyone. everyone. See you again soon. Bye.